everybody, it's Eric Papenfus. It's Friday, so it must be a bye day. And today, Amanda, we are gonna talk about three books related to African-American history between those critical years of the start of the Civil War and beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. We're gonna end February with a bang. Here we go. Let's get right to the books. And let's start with a book about an artist of African-Americans that perhaps you've never heard of, Amanda. Uh, and that is the artist Howard Whedon, huh. who um, is considered really the first American artist to produce truly empathetic and beautiful portraits of African Americans in the United States. Uh, and what makes it more remarkable is that they did this uh, during the period of Jim Crow in reaction to a lot of the stereotypical caricatures that sort of defined American society at that time. Mm. Um, and it was done by a remarkable person who wrote under the name of Howard Whedon. But the first thing that you should know, Amanda, is that Howard Whedon was a woman uh, named Maria. Uh, and uh, uh, the second thing, which is interesting, is that you can see that it was introduced, this particular book, by Joel Chandler Harris. Now, Harris has a, a very poor reputation today. He's sort of considered the ultimate cultural appropriator. Uh, he wrote all the Uncle Remus stories um, about the same time. But at the time this book was published, he was probably the most well-known folklorist of, in American culture at the time. So his imprimatur on a book uh, would be seen as really, uh, you know, helping generate sales. Mm. Although um, Paris thought that uh, uh, he was recommending the book of a man uh, and uh, didn't really find out until the two eventually met. Um, but let's talk about this book because it is absolutely remarkable. And let's, uh, let's refer to a couple of the poems and portraits. We're going to start here with this, one of my favorite ones, which is of this beautiful um, young girl. And uh, what was so successful is that, uh, that all the portraits capture uh, a sort of empathy and to some degree both a pride and a sadness that I think um, is very true. I'll read you a little bit of the poem. I'm not comfortable reading the dialect, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna change it to uh, uh, sort of Americanized English, but in the dusk of Chloe's rich brown cheek, the dimples are never at rest and bright would the glee of her young fate be, did not the eyes protest. And no one knows how the idle face so young and so nearly glad found and hid in its melting eyes that something so deep and sad. Mm. We're gonna to move to another one here, uh, which is uh, very, very interesting. And this is a commentary on uh, the Mammy caricature. And if you don't know the Mammy caricature, that was the standard sort of happy slave uh, that defined Jim Crow life in the South. But what's interesting is that Whelan uh, very consciously talks about how um, she uh, is painting a portrait here. The poem is in the voice of the, of, the, of the woman here. I can't allow my picture took the way you want to draw, a leaving off my freedom look for fashions for the war. No, Lord, my picture can't be caught by a man with no such manners. That's exactly why the war was fought, to end them same bandanas. Huh. So rather than wearing a neat red one with a bow on top, she's wearing it in a way which um, is more comfortable and not stereotypical. And uh, it is, uh, it's very, very explicit. And then here's a third one, uh, Amanda, which is also remarkable. This is on the cover of the book, but there is a silhouette. And now silhouettes were really the sign of in American culture up to that point, sort of white middle-class gentility. Quakers did them, other religious groups did them. But here is um, uh, Whelan's doing a silhouette of a uh, young African-American male and saying explicitly, she's not gonna do a drawing of this same male with a banjo, which uh, you would see in, in all the Jim Crow caricatures. Sure. We learn to vote and read and spell. We learn to taste our tears. And when you get that sponsible, the banjo disappears. Huh. So what an amazing book. Um, and today, if you go uh, to Alabama, uh, you can uh, go to the Whedon House. The Whedon House is a house museum, and all the examples of these original portraits are there uh, to be seen. And uh, she was uh, apparently appalled. She went to the Columbian Exposition in 1893 and was appalled by all the other artists' uh, depictions of African Americans mm. and wanted to do something different and published this amazing book, both of poetry and poems. All right, the second book 
is about the most famous African-American preacher of the late 19th century. And again, somebody that you've probably never heard of because his name was John Jasper. And uh, he is a little, little known today, although his most famous sermon uh, has been reprinted, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But Jasper grew up a slave uh, or enslaved in Virginia, uh, and he learned to preach and learned to read. He was fortunate to be able to learn to read. Um, and uh, he uh, used to give um, uh, sermons at uh, funerals. Funerals were one of the uh, few times in the sort of antebellum South where uh, the enslaved people could gather, allowed to celebrate, and, and, and preachers were allowed to preach. Um, after the war, uh, when he uh, became a, a, a freed individual, uh, Jasper started a Baptist congregation, which grew to several thousand in Richmond. And he, I say he was the most famous uh, African-American preacher of his day because he traveled uh, the country, he traveled the world, he preached in Paris, he preached in New York, he preached before the Virginia House of Delegates. Uh, and his most famous sermon, uh, Amanda, was a sermon called The Sun does move. And it's an ironic sermon because it is about how um, faith, uh, with faith, everything is possible. And, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, faith is the most important thing and you can even move, move the sun. Now, Jasper's preaching style was amazing. Let me read you uh, uh, a contemporary account of somebody who went to hear Jasper. Um, uh, the, the account uh, the guy wrote in his, his diary, he circled around the pulpit with his ankle in his hand and laughed and sang and shouted and acted about a dozen characters within the space of three minutes. Meanwhile, in spite of these things, he was pouring out a gospel sermon, red hot, full of love, full of invective, full of tenderness, full of bitterness, full of tears, full of every passion that ever flamed in the human breast. He was a theater within himself. Uh, I found myself unable to refrain and when asked, if I believe the sun do move, I raise my hand, not because I believe the sun moved, but because I believed in John Jasper. And I think huh. that was sort of the point. Um, with faith, anything is possible. The sermon is worth another read today because in the sermon, the critical point is uh, he comes across a white northern um, uh, a person who basically tells him, Jasper, you can't be preaching you know, things that go against science. You can't, uh, you can't say that you're, you're embarrassing your race. Um, Jasper says, uh, uh, no, I'm not. Um, I think you don't believe the sun can be moved because you can't, you know, you haven't been moved. You haven't experienced learning to read under slavery, um, learning to um, uh, that uh, be growing a, 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 a congregation in a very prejudiced world. And it's really a repudiation of, of uh, white people telling black people what to do. Hmm. And that is re even more remarkable that he gave it 20 500 times the same sermon wow. all over the world and people sort of got out of it different things but this book is also interesting amanda look because it includes a letter written oh, by wow. jasper in his handwriting in the 1880s to the owner of the book who was himself uh, a, a minister a baptist minister and uh it's an interesting letter because he basically says the, the, minister, the white minister writes Jasper and says, hey, can you tell me some anecdotes about your life? I'd like to write your mm. story. And Jasper says, I'm not telling you any anecdotes in my life. I'm going to tell my own story. I'm going to write my own story. He does it very politely, but that's uh, basically the gist of the letter. Huh. And an example of a tipped in manuscript found in the letter. And we're going to end with uh, one book from the Harlem Renaissance. It is a book of poetry, one of the most remarkable books uh, by County Cullen called Color. It's his first book. You know, he wrote this book, Amanda, when he was younger than you were. Oh. Much younger than I was, but he was in college, <laughs> which is which is pretty incredible. Wow. And um, he became a leading light of the Harlem Renaissance. He married W.B. Du Bois's daughter. Um, and uh, if, uh, if I can, I'll just uh, read you one poem called Atlantic City Waiter. With a subtle poise, he grips his tray of delicate things to eat, choice viands in their mouth, halfway the ladies watch his feet go carving dexterous avenues through sly intricacies ten thousand years on jungle clues alone shaped feet like these for him to be humble who is proud needs colder artifice though half his pride is disavowed in vain the sacrifice sheer through his acquiescent mask of bland gentility the jungle flames like a copper cask set where the sun strikes free a commentary on both uh, the racism of the day and uh, his African heritage, which informed his poetry. He believed that poetry could transcend race. 
He uh, battled back and forth with Langston Hughes uh, quite a bit, but is a remarkable person. And if we could, if we'll turn to the front, you can see that this book is actually inscribed wow. by County Cullen, which makes it really interesting. He says, as good as a premiere anyway. <laughs> so I don't know what he means by that, other than maybe better than going out on the town and uh, sitting home <laughs> and reading. Okay, we're gonna end with a funny book. Uh, I don't wanna have a funny book that uh, uh, is at all tied to those, but I did find a funny book uh, in the back uh, uh, when Alexander was doing some pricing. And uh, it's an example of the types of pamphlets that we have all for $20 and under here in the collectibles room. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a little bit more modern than you would think. It's a book from the 1950s. It's prospecting for uranium. Oh, no. Something which I bet you didn't think people did, but actually what's even more amusing about this is that there was a moment after World War II when the government encouraged people to go prospecting for uranium because we were trying to build up a domestic uranium source. Oh, my goodness. So this is actually a guidebook for how to go and uh, get your Geiger counter. <laughs> which you could buy at Sears Perfect. and go out <laughs> looking for uranium on your own. Um, and then the government would pay you if you found, uh, if you found sites for uranium. Uh, this did not last long. There were mm. some obvious problems with the prospecting. And to this day, I've never once thought about, hey kids, let's go prospecting for uranium. <laughs> Our funny book of the week, a little bit of interesting American history too. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you'll watch next week and every week, Fridays at noon, for more adventures in the world of books.